No, our colleagues, is there anybody outside the uh, uh, hall or we... I, I suppose we could start our next session after, after lunch session. And um, no, this session is probably the most, most intensive. And we have four presentations. According to our program, the first presentation is from Professor Antilla and later Professor Halloran, after is my colleague uh, Iris Lansdorf Vogelan, and also we have additionally one presentation from our colleague from Lithuania about colorectal screening in Lithuania, and later according program is uh, panel discussion planned. And now we start uh, our session, and the uh, session title is When a new screening program is to be launched or principal changes in an effective program are required. First presenter is uh, uh, Professor uh, Ahti Antil. Uh, he is director of screening registry of the Finnish Cancer Registry, as we know, and he's also a principal investigator of the evaluation of the Finnish cervical and breast cancer screening, and also work in Tampere University, or had work uh, as a professor in epidemiology, <laughs> and also he's uh, recently worked as a senior visiting scientist in the International Agency for Research on Cancer. Uh, and now, uh, floor is yours, and presentation about CanCon guidance to effective organized cancer screening. Please. Yeah, thank you very much, dear chairs, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen. So I will talk briefly about our work uh, and, and uh, part of this uh, CanCon guide that uh, did uh, short uh, slides on the morning, so that this is, I present briefly the most relevant recommendations that are included there in the guide in relation with cancer screening. So we have got a multi international team to produce this. We had partners from, in addition to Finland also uh, here, Riga, um, uh, Croatian, uh, Croatia, Croatian National Institute of Public Health, also from uh, Rotterdam, Netherlands, uh, Czech Republic, uh, and Italy. And then we had a very large number of uh, other collaborants. I think that we had more than 50 collaborative partners who also have been informed during this process and who have been able to see and comment our final guide. So that in the EU, it is the Council of the EU that recommends that if you organize cancer screening, do it only in population-based organized programs and avoid opportunistic testing or, or rather haphazard ways of providing the service. And there should be always appropriate quality assurance at all levels of the program. And these programs are nowadays recommended for breast cancer, cervical cancer, and colorectal cancer screening. And there are these EU quality assurance guidelines for each of the, these programs that have been also submitted by the Commission. So that this, uh, from this background, so we looked uh, uh, more carefully over the challenges on cancer screening. So most EU countries already follow the, the recommendation of the Council at some level. But there are really uh, serious barriers still in many countries. For instance, there may be lack of appropriate monitoring and evaluation, so that even though in very, very large-scale service, we don't know really what are the benefits, what are the problems in the service. And in many programs, for instance, the attendance late rate is still so low that the program are hardly effective in the population, so that there are these uh, kind of problems that indicate the need for quality improvement at the CanCon guide then we'll talk about. There, I don't show today, but uh, maybe within a month there will be a publication at the implementation status of cancer screening in the EU that is published, that will be published by the Commission and I think that these barriers will be elaborated very 
very uh, convincing also from that report. So that um, <clears throat> in our chapter, uh, what we used as the meteorology, we looked to information about uh, efficacy, effectiveness also, uh, harm so screening from recent available reviews and guidelines, uh, supplemented particularly for potential new cancer screenings, uh, guidelines and systematic reviews were not available. We looked at implementation status reports, uh, had uh, governance models, and um, we had uh, altogether five uh, working group meetings during the uh, almost three-year work. Two of the meetings were held here in Riga, one on colorectal cancer screening, one on gastric cancer screening. It was a very good experience to visit here already earlier. So when thinking about cancer screening, what are the essential elements in it? And so that everybody knows this Wilson and Jungner criteria that were published already in the 60s. And what we found that there is also uh, update uh, the principles by the WHO. So that when thinking uh, cancer screening in general, there need to be uh, recognized need for common disease or uh, co common cause of death, um, the objectives of screening should be really well defined, a defined target population, repeated screening there, and also evidence to, before starting that can be used to, um, uh, in the planning of the program and also uh, make the program um, decisions, the basis of the decisions uh, right. And also, um, in current times, we think that uh, the program should also have the integrated organization, evaluation, also education. That is, that the cancer screening program is the multidisciplinary undertaking, and these, these various steps uh, need to be integrated from the beginning and taken into account in, in planning for cancer screening. And then also this quality assurance is one of the cornerstones of cancer screening and there is no space to make uh, uh, reductions in, in, in its importance. The program should also ensure informed choice and respect for autonomy, particularly for the screenies. Uh, they need to, the screening providers and screening owners, uh, program owners, they have to provide also the data for the population. What were the harms, what were the benefits and adjust all the communication accordingly. The program should also promote equity and access to services. And equity is a larger issue than only attendance to screening. It is also the issue to provide the optimal quality of the service to all groups, also the socially deprived groups. And evaluation should be integrated from the beginning and screening should outweigh harms and benefit and also be cost effective. So that for all those kind of phases to integrate in program planning, it is this governance that is the key concept. And in cancer screening implementation, we have many phases like consensus building before start planning, looking what is the evidence now, is, is there any grounds to consider to start cancer screening. Then start planning, that is always a very long process, if that is long done right, and heavy process also. Then after planning, preferably piloting, not to enter the full-scale program, but in planning, after planning to do piloting where the program is tested, that it works right until it will be spread to all population, and then the national rollout and implementation, and then modification or running, or even stopping if the work or program does not work right. So this is very challenging to think all of these kind of cycles, and then when you are thinking that now it is ready, like cervical cancer screening, it is, but that could work very well. When we have these new methods like HPV vaccination, HPV testing, many new novel methods, so we have to think how we can utilize these methods in the program and even in a well-established program, go back to pre-planning phase and think of quality improvement cycles. We also run one survey that uh, on the basic uh, 
components of governance and um, within the work package. So Andre Mayek and Stefan Lundberg uh, were leaders of this project. So we had um, chosen to this survey to do in all EU member states and EFTA countries and got from out of the 35 countries good responses from 33. So that this is showing uh, one of these uh, interesting elements. So what is the current need of these recommendations of governance? Um, for instance, that the ministries of health are able to prepare the decisions and integrate also the various professionalities, social groups, also uh, patient groups and citizens group into the process. There need to be certain structures, screening boards, um, uh, coordination committees and then management teams for instance to coordinate the service advisory reports linking the coordination to uh, service providing and quality assurance that is also preferably <coughs> integrated with national quality manuals with national quality targets and these quality manuals should be integrated and well in balance with the European guidelines too so that there, it seems really that these kind of very basic elements are still missing from a number of countries. Like screening port is there already <coughs> in many, but not in all countries. 22 out of uh, 33. Management team has been nominated in 18 countries out of 33. So that what we look from this chapter and from this work in Cancun so that we could help these countries who are struggling to get good resources for these basic structures. Another example of legal frameworks, does it allow invitation or in the number six below, does the legal framework allow not only linkages, uh, screening records, cancer causes that records, but also auditing and rereading a potentially false negative slides, so that there are still shortcomings in many countries in these basic requirements. So while during this work, we wanted also to provide information, what kind of elements are essential for the legal frameworks and how the laws could be written to enable, enable the whole thing. So this is an example of governance structure. Everything is done under the Ministry of Health Without involvement of the ministry and government, it is not really possible to do population-based service. We need screening board or board that is involved, another name, but taking, preparing the decisions at the ministry, at the national level. And then maybe also, depending on the country, also could be some regional levels. We need steering board that is specific for each program because there are different specialists in cervical cancer screening than breast cancer screening. We need management teams and voice reports. Um, the recommendations are that we cannot say that this one slide is a model for every country, but there are the elements and the countries really have to take into account all those steps in the governments and, and, and build up a component governance structure for the country. Another uh, recommendation of the legal frameworks to build up to enable all these requirements that are uh, described in the quality assurance guidelines, all the quality assurance processes there. And then what is uh, also a new recommendation so that uh, we recommend that for the quality assurance itself there should be the regular budget at, uh, at, in the screening budget. We say it is a mini, minimum 10% of total expet, expenditure, the full-scale program. We also listed the main budgetary items uh, so that quality assurance is more than only the quality management, the clinical diagnostic environment. So it is also developing population-based registers development uh, of quality manuals with non dual quality indicators and standards, um, reporting P key performance indicators, all indicators, not only a less than minimum set of indicators, all the necessary indicators, even retrospective evaluation of effectiveness, adverse effects, harms, benefits, and 
Also part of the quality improvement, it can be prospective evaluation new methods. Like in HPV testing, you cannot get the data from clinical trials in hospital in environments. You have to evaluate the new method within your program setting. Otherwise, you don't know if it was better or it was not better. So that, sure, we need first to do some clinical validation studies, but then the evaluation of new methods has to be done in the program settings, and there are still a lot of potential to improvement while adopting continuously new methods in cancer screening. Uh, the second set of recommendations related to organization, integrated evaluation, so that um, there should be coordinated planning, piloting, rollout process, adequate mandate and resources for coordination, um, also information systems. And benefits and harms need to be measured and clearly communicated. Cost effectiveness should be there also on the agenda. So that not only before the decision, but when the program has been run, the effectiveness can be measured and then it can be reassured that the program is working right, also in terms of cost effectiveness. And, and then when you have these very difficult problems, for instance, to solve the problem, how the, uh, how the attendance rate could be improved or how the um, uh, adherence to guidelines, protocols can be improved so that we need also research. It is not only guidelines, but we need also research to find the key problems and best solutions to the current environment. And, it is very important this research is not only done in the very rich settings where things are already pretty well, but also in these lower research settings where these barriers particularly exist. I mean that in a country like Latvia, you would have enormously good potential for transition research on cancer screening issues. For potential new cancer screening programs, what we looked uh, was the current uh, documents, international documents that are dealing with the criteria, and then we would like to summarize this criteria to the question if the Minister of Health, Ministry of Health would consider other need to do any other screenings than those three that are nowadays recommended, so that in this evaluation and assessment, this information about efficacy and effectiveness from very long-term randomized trial documenting if there is benefit in mortality, what are the basic harms. This kind of effectiveness is one very important criteria then that the benefits outweigh the harms in another one, and then health, economic evol evolution, third criteria. This is the main criteria. And uh, then f sure that even though all those three steps could be passed for some potential program, then it will launch lots of other needs to investigate uh, feasibility and, and respective aspect resources and so on. So that <coughs> we wanted to get, go through with these three main criteria, then the potential uh, interesting uh, other cancer sites and three mentioned mainly prostate, can gastric, lung and ovary cancer screening. We did not want to make any recommendations. We couldn't make any recommendation, should you screen or not, but we wanted to look what are the main criteria. Um, in health economical decisions, it is very dif difficult nowadays at the pan-European level because there is so much variation in the resources by member states. And in many member states, no health economical analysis is done as a part of, uh, of this assessment on cancer screening. And no criteria are available. What should be the threshold, for instance, acceptable cost for the healthcare system? So that these member states should improve in this. In generally speaking, at the EU, in those countries that have some thresholds, so it varies from around 20,000 to 30,000. And this is mainly available for the rich countries. Um, <clears throat> and what is that thing that particularly in the lower resource settings uh, this, and these uh, thresholds are not available. And when we look for the resources, this is for instance uh, resources in healthcare available, available per 
inhabitants. So that these rich countries that are nearly in, this is public sector, this is pri private sector, that are somewhere in 4,000 euro per inhabitant and purchase power corrected figures. The, these lowest resource settings ha are below 1,000, around 700 euro per year. Whereas, for instance, United States, Norway, again, the resources are completely different, and therefore it is very difficult nowadays to try to make some pan-European conclusions based on health economics. Okay, for prostatic cancer screening, there is good evidence from the European randomized trial that uh, PSA screening results in a decrease in breast can uh, prostatic cancer mortality. Sure that there is also this harm aspect over diagnosis, over treatment, and then in some other trials, like in the US, where the spontaneous use of the PSA test is very prevalent, there was no similar impact. The problem is still at the European level that the estimated quali quality of the life year gain is still pretty hard for many member states, and there may be some screening strategies that could become more better cost eff effective, but we still uh, need some further feasibility research really to find those things. Lung cancer screening, there's also some trials indicating decreasing lung cancer mortality, uh, but uh, the protocols have been uh, rather problematic in the first trials, like in this US study. Uh, the test methods were such that uh, probability of false positive test results was extremely high in almost 30 percent in the first couple of rounds. And uh, in two European uh, countries, there are trials still ongoing that have improved the protocols to get uh, avoid this uh, over uh, 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 of this uh, poor specificity of the test to, to avoid. Uh, false positives and, uh, the, and also to take into account better to, uh, stopping uh, of interventions to stop smoking in, in the same protocols because we know that intervention to stop smoking is extremely much more cost effective and healthy than lung cancer screening is, can never be so that there is still these trials ongoing and uh, we had to wait until these trials will be result, uh, will be reported. So that, and also using the U.S. protocols, it seems that uh, uh, lung cancer screening doesn't really satisfy the, uh, the health economics that are in most European countries. For ovarian cancer screening, there are a couple of trials published, but not yet very clear results on efficacy. And these trials, particularly the European trial in the U.K. The follow-up is still continuing. For gastric cancer screening, this is very interesting because the helicobacter pylori and related changes in mucosa, it, it really can uh, induce high risk of gastric cancer and so that there's good potential for screening. But right now, uh, we don't know yet what would be the best strategy of the different strategies. And so we need also new trials and in this sense, also the trial here in Latvia, GISTAR trial, is one very important thing for the whole to Europe, and uh, this effort needs uh, good support. So, what are our conclusion recommendations for new cancer screening programs? So that we don't re uh, we don't recommend any other programs. It seems that the criteria are not clearly met yet in all to Europe. So, continue research uh, on new cancer. Uh, screening programs, also randomized trials, finance at randomized trials, and do research collaboration, and try to obtain better quantitative estimates describing harms and benefits in the healthcare settings that we have in different EU countries. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation, for overview of uh, your uh, work packages, uh, let's say, pre pre preliminary results, as I see. Uh, any questions from the audience, please, colleagues? Before you know, maybe... Uh, um, 
Thank you very much, Ati, for a very interesting presentation. Of course, as you can understand, I was triggered by your comment that um, we currently lack criteria um, for um, health economical assessment of screening. And I was wondering what makes screening so special that the regular economical cr criteria don't um, suffice? Yeah, because um, the problem is that in health economical evaluations, the results can vary a lot depending what was your methodology. And we know that like for breast cancer screening, one study published that quality for 50 to I think 69 with two year intro, one study published that the quality cost, quality cost is let us say 4,000, another 17,000. And then there are some studies suggesting that it could be even tens of thousands of US dollars. And, and, and all, all those results are relevant if you understand what are the methods. And, and if we don't have standard methods, then it is very difficult to compare these thresholds between countries. Like the Netherlands is a good example that you have developed the standard methodology, then you understand what is your threshold. And so that this is a very important part in decision making on cancer screenings. But if a member state does not have a similar system, so I don't know, for instance, what is your guess? What would be then if, if in the Netherlands you have 4,000 euro per inhabitant healthcare in general, in Latvia, let us say 700. So would you then divide just the Dutch limit? by this difference. I don't think that this would be right thing. There, there need to be some other processes, but that is simply that uh, this is that this needs collaboration yeah. in future collaboration. I totally agree with that uh, assessment. And I think that just dividing it will definitely not give you the answer that we're looking for. So that's a good thing. The other question that I had is you suggested that none of the considered cancer screen, new cancer screening programs uh, was ready for prime time yet. Um, what studies do we need right now for, uh, it's good that you brought up prostate cancer screening because that's where we're going to go. What data do you think we need that we're currently lacking before we can indeed start to um, uh, recommend yeah. or not recommend prostate yeah, cancer for screening? For instance, for prostate cancer screening, that is, this fin Finland also have been a component in this uh, randomized studies so that the problem is that we don't see much impact or almost any impact and we have same time also very widespread opportunistic testing and also very wide clinical use of the PA, PSA test in those men who have um, uh, uh, urinating symptom or something other uh, clinical indications to do the test so that uh, I mean that the problem is that even though the recommendation is that don't do opportunistic testing, there are still so much opportunistic testing in place and we don't know how we can control that. I seen that like in the Netherlands there was not so much o increase or over increase in the incidence of prostatic cancer when the trial started, but in later years there are also in the Netherlands and we don't completely understand from where does this come. Is it this clinical testing or opportunistic testing? So that that is something that we, uh, the trial. I hope that the trialists could acquire the data and describe it better, and and sure that another possibility is to do some prospective research on this. That is also acceptable in these conditions. For lung cancer, as I said, uh, this one study in the U.S. is not enough yet to recommend screening, it, it, there are too, too much costs, too much uh, harms also. And, and as an epidemiologist, I must say that if, if somebody reports even a very large trial, it still needs replication so that in the causality terms, we need as minimum three trials or even two is better than one so that we have to wait for the results and then look in our own settings. For lung can uh, the stomach cancer, it is really hard thing because helicobacter pylori infection is so common. And if you treat everybody who are infected, then the then these treatments, eradication treatments, would have very serious adverse effects also in long term. 
And uh, therefore, maybe a better strategy could be to treat than um, uh, screening for precancerous lesions. But the problem is that then you may lose some sensitivity, so that here we really need these trials to indicate what is the outcome if you treat precancerous lesions only with a certain test system. Mm, thank you. Questions from the audience? No? Uh, one uh, question about uh, uh, you, in your presentation, lack of monitoring and evaluation, you said, in many countries. Uh, do you have any ideas? What is the main reason? It's only money or other, other aspects? Why this is lack of monitoring and evaluation? I don't think that it is lack of money, because if you don't monitor, then you spend more money than if you don't monitor. In those, it is something like in attitudes of decision makers and key clinical associations and groups who participate in planning for cancer screening. It is more question like that because if you plan cost-effective program and you run it and you monitor and you know that that's all service, then usually you pay much less than you run something that is not monitored. Uh, for instance, if you don't discover that your test or treatment system did not have the impact on reducing the incidence or the diseases or making diagnosis earlier or preventing deaths, then you pay both for the screening test and the treatment costs. So it is for the healthcare system that is more expensive than, than, uh, than well-planned, monitored and evaluated system because then you always see that it works and if it does not work then you know where you can improve or where you have to improve. So this is lack of understanding. Thank you for the an answer. And question. Yes, one question from the audience. I just wanted to add to this to the last question. In a way it is a lack of money it's in the lack of lack of money in the right budget. Uh, so it's the budget, the, the money is there, but it's siloed in different uh, budgets. And that is why it is so important to have this quality assurance budget as a specified uh, budgetary item, because then, um, um, then it would be possible to, to finance this activity. But as Arti said, I mean, in total, it's not, it's not a question. Okay, thank you for your not question, but answer. Anyway, thank you for okay, thank our you. presenter. And it's my pleasure to announce our next speaker, um, Professor Stephen Halloran, who used to be the director of the National Health Services Bowel Cancer Screening Program uh, of the Southern Hub uh, in England. And he um, always has great slides, so I, I, I'm a little bit scared to go after him here right after this. But um, <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Stephen, and uh, the floor is yours. there eventually. Success. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great privilege to be here. Uh, I am, like one of the earlier speakers, uh, uh, visiting Riga again, having thoroughly enjoyed it on my first visit. So thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, Marcius, and thank you very much, Ati, for the invitation. I'm talking about implementation of FIT-based colorectal cancer screening. That's what I was asked to talk about in 15 minutes. Not possible to do it in 15 minutes. I noticed that the program has extended to 20 minutes, so we'll see how we get on. <laughs> Plenty. All right, we shall see. Fortunately, I am building on information that's already been given you because Atty has gone through the logistics. Uh, of setting up a screening program. I'm, what I'm going to do is tell a story of actually how you put that into action, how it actually worked in England, and I'll reflect on uh, what's worked and what hasn't worked and what lessons might be, might be uh, gained by looking at that screening program. And I 
am, like has been stressed again and again, talking about population-based screening. We're looking at everybody. The success of a programme for screening is to get to the most worthy, the most needy individuals who are very easily missed. So for us, the story began in 1990. Uh, it was during that period of time that a number of randomised controlled trials demonstrated unequivocally that you could reduce mortality for colorectal cancer by screening. A little later than that, we got financial commitment from government. Uh, that initially was money to set up a pilot, and that pilot is pretty critical. It's been stressed by ATI. It's a matter of building a team of individuals, uh, developing an organisation structure for the screening programme, identifying uh, quality standards. We had to grow our endoscopy capacity. Um, we needed to commission software, which is critical to the success of the process, and then we needed to pilot it to make sure that it worked in our setting. We commenced 2006, we're dealing with a significantly larger population with Latvia, and for the population that we're meant to be screening, that's 17 million people, a lot of colonoscopy, way beyond the capacity that we had at the time. We phased the implementation, initially 60 to 69, and, and then later 70 to 74, although we did make the provision that people could opt in beyond the age of 74, but they're not invited. And we had a phase three where there was a question as to what we should do. I'm not going to address that in my presentation, but I'm happy to take questions at the end if you wish. How did the process work? Well, there was a pre-invitation sent out centrally with a leaflet that explained what it was all about. Uh, we then sent, by default, a test kit that was sent out centrally, not through general practice, it was sent out centrally. Uh, and that happened unless you put your hand up and said, I don't want it. After 30 days, if we'd had no response, we sent a reminder. And then, if there was no response, the episode was closed at three months, and you were re-invited as a matter of course at two years. If the result is negative, uh, then, uh, there's, uh, then you're again invited in two years' time. But if it was positive, then we would notify the GP. Now, the GP up to this point in time has not been engaged, but at this point, they know. They know by first-class mail very quickly after the test has been done. But on the same day that the test has been performed, an appointment is made to see a screening nurse to find out what the next step should be. The expectation is that you will have colonoscopy, but there's an opportunity to discuss that with the screening nurse. And you can see there, 14 days is required by government that people are offered a screening appointment, and 14 days after that, if it's appropriate to have colonoscopy, that colonoscopy is made available. Now, a, a large population, so to deal with that, the population was split up into five areas. In fact, I had responsibility for that one at the bottom, the 14.8 million uh, population that we were dealing with from the southern hub. Those hubs had day-to-day -day responsibility for the organisation of the programme. There were central diktats, so we were running to a central format, but we had responsibility for our individual areas. The call and the recall was looked after by those hubs, as was the laboratory analysis, and a helpline service that was there to help individuals who had questions and queries about whether they should be screened. And we were also then charged with making the appointments for potential colonoscopy and data analysis so we could see how the program was going. For that to work effectively, there was a necessity to have a computer system, a national computer system, a web-based computer system that would monitor what was going on. Each of those five hubs then served a number of screening centres. And the screening centres were the administrative centres for both the nurse appointments and the colonoscopy. So we had a number of clinic sites where individuals could be seen and their results and their family circumstances and their medical history could be considered. Following on from that, there would be colonoscopy at bespoke sites. And this is where the quality issue that's been mentioned several times already comes into play. 
The whole programme is subject to quality assurance. There's an accreditation process for all the hubs, for all the screening centres, for all the pathology activities, for all of the individuals who are engaged in the process. There are key performance indicators that apply to all aspects of the programme. There's a process of continuous audit to ensure that, w that every element of the screening programme is meeting those key performance indicators. There's a process of peer review, so pathologists would gather together nationally to assess performance. That would be true of endoscopists and nurses and laboratory activities. And then there would be an overall evaluation of the whole programme to ensure it was going in the right direction. And those processes in endoscopy were sort of supported by a, a global rating scale, which was a web-based tool to assess the quality of endoscopy, critical to a screening program of this sort. And then we had a joint advisory group that essentially accredited those screening centres on a regular basis against those uh, criteria, that global rating score. And in fact, those principles have been exported from the UK and are used in many other countries now. Now, I mentioned how we phased the rollout of the program. Not only did we do that, we phased the rollout of the centres. That, was, that happened by default. Once the program commenced, then each centre had to meet all of the standards that were required before they could go live. And that naturally meant that there were screening centres that uh, developed their facilities rapidly and they met the criteria, other ones that took a long period of time. So you can see it took quite a long time before that first phase of, program, of uh, screening between 60 and 69 was completely rolled out. But the limiting factor was not the program philosophy or money, it was purely the quality of the service that was being provided. Overall, the process of screening is complex. There are lots of elements to it. There is something in the order of 150 different letters that go out centrally from the programme in the light of various circumstances that arise. But if I just highlight a few things that I think are important. The pre-invitation is important. We know there's good evidence to show to give people warning that they're going to receive a kit increases uptake. It gives them that sort of edge on what's going to happen. We know that the reminder also increases. There's been talk about sending a second reminder, but then you begin to harass individuals and it begins to become coercion. We also know, if you look internationally, that including general practice practitioners in terms of involving them in the outcomes is, is important, but to have them as a step in the process of sending out a kit reduces uptake. So we chose not to include them at that stage. We also found that the, what we call the SSP, the Specialist Screening Practitioner Clinics, were valuable because people were nervous about colonoscopy and there was no commitment to have colonoscopy in the light of the test. There was an opportunity to discuss it and assess it. Surveillance for us was an integral part of the screening program and continues to do so. And we're in the process at the moment of, of reviewing that surveillance to see whether uh, it's more extensive than necessary. And the free phone helpline proved invaluable. A large number of telephone calls came through from worried people. And what about the outcomes? Okay, well, this is the outcome at colonoscopy from the first, first occasion that people have screened. And you can see there, 9% of, of the people who had colonoscopy had cancer. The majority of those cancers sta were stage 1 and 2. They were uh, easily accessible. The prognosis was extremely good. Uh, poly polyps, uh, adenomas were categorised uh, and were subject to surveillance. And as you, as you see, as you move from episode 1 of screening to 2 and to 3, all of those were subject, all the adenomas were subject to polypectomy, but you can see that the, the number, the proportion of cancers that were detected diminished. On each round of screening, we're reducing uh, the burden of pathology, and that's true of the adenomas as well. So the headline statistics uh, in England were that there were an awful lot of invitations, a lot of tests, a lot of colonoscopies, 27,000 cancers were identified, 86,000 advanced adenomas were identified and removed. 
So those are the headlines. We also have a, a graphic which is becoming a headline. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, it's important to have a link with the cancer registries, and we can see now that there is evidence that the number of cancers is beginning to fall away. And that may have been due to the screening program. Difficult to prove it one way or another. OK, so we've done pretty well. Um, but for a program to be successful, it needs to be maintained. It needs to be monitored and needs to be kept in good repair because things aren't static. So if you're doing the program properly, you're gathering information which will allow you to look at, for instance, endoscopy weights. And you can see how the waiting time diminished over a period of time as we monitored and improved things. We looked at the quality of the colonoscopy, not just in terms of clinical outcomes, but how it was uh, seen by the patients in terms of comfort scores and safety and, and, and appropriateness. And we did look at completion rates. So this is completion, getting the scope right through to the cecum. Uh, and we continue to monitor that uh, using photographic information. Uptake, of course, is very important. It's been highlighted at this meeting already. If you're gathering information, you can see that your coverage, the area that you were concerned with, is, is good. And that's the area that I had responsibility for. You can see that there are areas where the uptake is pretty good. And you can see areas where the uptake is poor. So you can focus your attention on those areas. You may also see that there are areas where the positivity rate is surprisingly high. And this is a, in a, a, a Nepalese population uh, and may be associated with the way the test was being performed. You can look at the population as a whole and see there are some slight differences between men and women and the ages and the major differences that exist because of ethnic differences and deprivation. So again, those are areas where you need uh, to put attention. We see the, uh, the socioeconomic profile, that, what I've called the posh, the wealthy population, uh, where their uptake of the program is good, and the deprived population where it's poor. So all of these require a process of quality improvement, setting realistic standards, monitoring, identifying where there are weaknesses, carrying out research to find solutions, piloting them, implementing them, and then recommencing the cycle. The principles that ATI has espoused to you. But sometimes it needs more than just tweaking. Sometimes it's necessary to have a more major overhaul. And for us, that came and is still progressing with the transition from doing a GUIAC test, which is where the randomized control trials were, how the randomized control trials were conducted, to FIT. Um, so we have conducted pilot, a pilot, a pilot for half of the country, um, and that was aimed to increase uh, uptake and to address a number of the other issues that I've highlighted already. So this is uh, a graph that shows the uptake in various scores. So this is the index of multiple deprivation. Uh, IMD1 is the posh wealthy population, and IMD5 is the poor population. That's how it was with GUIAC. After FIT, and this is, I've chosen the London population, you can see there's a marked increase in uptake in all groups. Overall, um, I've got a graph here which shows two areas of the country, the southern part and the Midlands and Northwest. As you move from GUIAC to FIT, there's overall a 7% increase. And that translate, translates into 290,000 more people being invited, not being invited, taking up the test per annum. So that's a substantial impact. But when you're setting out a program using quantitative fit, you have the dilemma of where you set the cutoff point. And that's the process that we're currently going through in England, uh, UK as a whole, in fact. And as you make the test more sensitive, uh, then, of course, that means you're referring more people to colonoscopy. And there's no point in doing that unless you've got the colonoscopy, colonoscopy capacity to deal with it. And there are a number of countries that have dived into screening using FIT uh, and have not assessed properly the endoscopy resource. Now, sadly, in the UK, our endoscopy resource has been uh, made appropriate for GUIAC. It's not 
appropriate for the potential of fit, and so uh, our cutoff is probably going to be really rather high, but we'll have aspirations to improve that over a period of time. Fit offers lots of potential, and it can be combined with other scores that will ultimately improve uh, screening for women, for the elderly, and potentially for reluctant participants. I haven't got time to discuss this any further, but it's important if you are setting up a new screening program that you make provision for these other risk factors. We know that age and sex on their own are risk, risk factors for, uh, for, uh, colon, uh, for colon cancer. Screening history. If you haven't been screened on several occasions, your risk is higher than a population that has been screened. We know that deprivation, medical history, family history, and lifestyle are all risk factors. And those have the potential of contributing to getting an even better assessment of the likelihood of colorectal cancer. So those can be joined with FIT to form a, a score that will give you better screening, uh, a better positive predictive value, making it more cost effective and with better colonoscopy results. That's a process of personalizing screening. And I suggest that that is where screening is gradually moving to. Uh, if we take heed of the potential of fit, that's where we will be in the future. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Stephen. I think I didn't lie one word when I say that you make terrific slides. And I see that we have a question from the audience. Marcis, go ahead. <clears throat> Now it's maybe better. Okay, sorry. Uh, we have had Roland Valori here a year and a half ago, and, and he was really demonstrated the excellent quality of, of colonoscopy and how this has to be really followed. The question is, and what you have mentioned in your presentation, is that these are uh, screening assistants or screening nurses that are involved in referring for colonoscopy, and GPs are noted on this. I think this is a very critical issue indeed, who is making the decision whether the individual who is testing positive with the fit test is being referred to colonoscopy or not. What are your comments whether this should be GP? On one hand, we consider that GP should be responsible for the uh, patients. On the other hand, we definitely know that uh, although we would expect that the best quality of the recommendations be provided from the GPs in respect to the uh, colonoscopy, bowel prep and things like this, but this is not happening in the real life. Could you comment on this and what have been your decisions and the reasons behind it? It's a good question and it's an issue that many countries uh, struggle with. I'm currently doing quite a lot of work with Canada, who initially wanted to start their screening program having referral from the centre, but uh, eventually the, the mechanism that was placed upon them by the government, the provincial government, was that it had to go through general practice. My personal view is that the general practice, general practitioner plays a, a critical role in supporting and encouraging the process. They play a critical role, I think, for those individuals who choose not to be screened or to ignore screening. But once, a, once there is a positive test result, the expectation is that colonoscopy will take place. That, that's the premise that you work from. However, there will be circumstances where an individual will feel uncomfortable about that process, there will be quite clear medical situations, not a lot, but there will be clear medical situations where it's going to be inappropriate, particularly in the elderly population. And we do have the opportunity for people to continue to, to put their hand up and be screened into their 80s or potentially their 90s, where it may not be appropriate. Um, so, so the process of having a specialist screening practitioner allows you to use somebody who has 
great expertise in the area of uh, screening. They understand the results, they understand the epidemiology, they understand the colonoscopy, they're working alongside a group of colonoscopists. So I think they're in a very strong position to discuss the situation with the individuals who've had a positive test and ultimately decide jointly whether to continue to do it. And frankly, there are very few people who choose at that point in time uh, not to do it. Once they've got as far as the specialist screening practitioner, then most people go on and do it. How big is management team for screening in your hub? And what about laboratories for fit screening? It is one centralized or several laboratories? I, I missed the first bit of your question. Uh, how big is management team? Okay, all right. So I, I mentioned that we had five, five hubs. So we had the largest, largest hub uh, serving a population of about 14 million. And, and the smallest, I think, is London with around about eight and a half, nine million. That's the population they're serving. Remember that that hub is not just doing the analysis. It's sending out the kits. It's receiving the kits. It's sending out all of the letters. I've mentioned a few of them already, but there are a lot more. They're taking, in our situation, about 4,000 telephone calls a week. That group of people, and we didn't draw a line between analysts and helpline people and people doing the letters. They were supervised uh, by a very small team that had particular skills. They all did it, and that, for us, that was around about 50 people. Uh, if you were to look at London with... with almost half that population, the numbers would be around about half. So it's quite a tight economic group, but it relies upon the computer doing much of the work. The computer just means that there is consistency across the whole process, and by pressing a button, the letters for the day pour out. The letters of referral pour out. So it, it, it becomes a relatively straightforward process. It'll become simpler with fit because we'll have one test rather than three tests being done. Other questions from the audience? Otherwise, I'll. And I would like to ask two short clarification questions. And one question was why? Uh, invitation, uh, in what way you are sending invitation? It is paper letter or other invitation? Is it a paper invitation? It is paper it, it, it's, it's, it's a paper, yeah. What happens is, I mentioned we have a pre-invitation. So that's, that's a letter explaining what, what's going to happen. Um, and a pamphlet, a coloured pamphlet that explains what, what bowel cancer is um, and what the process is. It doesn't go into detail about the colonoscopy. That only happens if you get a positive test result. And then on the, on the, the following week, when you get the invitation, you actually get the kit. It's the kit, there's a letter, and there's an envelope to send it back. So there's no costs involved. There's the process of sending it out and sending it back is all coped it with is, centrally. It's uh, ordinary mail, really. Sorry? You use uh, formal ma uh, mail, uh, mail office. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. It's all done, all done by mail. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. And yeah. Uh, also one question. Um, uh, you show this, uh, resp um, this uh, no response uh, rate in different areas, approximately 66% and around 30% in one presentation. Do you have idea why so huge difference in different areas? Well, in fact, of course, the, the, the variation is, is it's about 90% amongst the population who are regular performers. So about 90% of people who've done it in the past will continue to do it, and then, you, then you're down to sort of 20% uh, of the pop. There's, there's, a 20, there's a chance of 20% amongst a, a deprived population. Why that, why that difference? It's very interesting. There's been a lot of work done in the UK looking at those deprived populations and looking at what measures can be taken to increase uptake. Um, it's still unclear, other than they fall into these, these groups of, of deprivation and ethnicity. And we found that different ethnic groups have different uptakes. Um, 
measures to I improve them by sending letters that have got GP names on them, or uh, simplifying the information, none of those have made any significant difference. What did make a difference, as you can see, was the transition from GUIAC to FIT, where you had a, a simpler test and only one test. That seems to make the difference. Thank you. If no more questions, uh, we say thank you, speaker. Thank you. For your presentation. And uh, next speaker is my colleague from. Uh, it is Lansdorf Wogelan from the Netherlands. And uh, as I know, she is a uh, professor at the Department of Public Health. And also, she is a member of the European Cancer Network and lead author of the chapter in the European Guidelines for Quality Assurance in Colorectal Cancer Screening. And now, your presentation, floor is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, Marces, uh, for the opportunity to present here today on the lessons that we've learned from implementing an organized colorectal cancer screening program in the Netherlands. Um, I would like to start off with some bragging about our program because we consider the program to be a great success. Um, in the years 2014 and 2015, so it's a very fresh program, it just started uh, two years, or now three years ago. Um, in the first two years of the program, we have managed to invite almost two million people to this program, of whom 1.4 million, so 72%, participated, which is incredibly high and the highest among the world. And in those 1.4 million people, uh, almost 6,500 colorectal cancers were detected and almost 34,000 advanced adenomas were detected. So we consider this indeed to be a great success. And what I'm going to present to you here today is what I think are the key factors that have contributed to that success. And before I start off, I just want to say a little bit that actually the organization of the program is very similar to the organization as it is in the UK. So I was pleased to find out that we have actually taken a little bit different uh, ways of presenting things so that there will not be too much overlap, fortunately. But if you want to know more details about the program, how it is organized and how the fits are being d distributed, etc., just think of the previous presentation and that will give you a good idea of how it works also in the Netherlands. So, I have identified what I believe are four key factors to the success of the program. First of all, it has been the pilot studies that have been performed in our country since 2006. Then there was a feasibility study uh, being performed in 2010 and 2011. Afterwards, followed by a planning period uh, in 2012 and 2013. Then finally, in 2014, the program started, which was characterized by continuous monitoring and evaluation. Um, to provide a little bit of background and to immediately start off with the thing that we did actually very poorly, um, as uh, Stephen also already pointed out, the first evidence from randomized controlled trials for the effectiveness of colorectal cancer screening by means of the Guayac fecal occult blood test was already available in, 19, in the 1990s. And it took us, in the Netherlands, more than 10 years before there was finally consensus among all stakeholders that we should have colorectal cancer screening, and that before we start that, we should do some pilot studies to identify which gaps in knowledge were still there. And so that's what we've done starting in 2006. There were several pilot studies that were comparing the participation and the yield of different screening modalities, namely the FIT, the GUIAC FOET, sigmoidoscopy, colonoscopy, and CT colonography. And what these studies unequivocally showed is that it really matters which test you perform. If you see uh, in this uh, picture here that on the left here is the adherence, and here down here you see the tests. And you see immediately that if we were to offer colonoscopy screening in our population, actually only 22% of the people that will be invited would participate in screening. However, on the other extreme, there was the FIT test, the fecal immunochemical test, and you see here that with that test, we would achieve in the pilot studies an adherence rate of 62%. So 62% of people invited would participate. And this is considerably higher, that's also what Stephen showed before, than with the GUIAC fecal blood test, despite there are some similarities in the test. 
because there are so many more people participating, although the fit may not be as good as a test as colonoscopy with respect to sensitivity, the actual yield of the program per thousand people invited already in the first round of screening was equal for colonoscopy and for fit screening. But then, of course, with fit screening, you have several opportunities of where you want to determine the cutoff. So the next step of those pilot studies was to see and compare where you want to have the cutoff for a positive test. And what you see here is that if you would take a very sensitive test with a cutoff of, eight point, uh, of 10 micrograms per gram fetus, which is what we should be using now, and I actually adjusted that, but used the wrong version, I'm afraid, um, that you would get a positivity rate of 8%, which is quite high. And as Stephen also already pointed out, we don't have the colonoscopy capacity to do so. So you could do different cutoffs to see where you want to have your test. OK, but then which cutoff should we use? And that's where we have been using decision modeling. And we have performed a cost-effectiveness analysis with our model and looked at what are the costs and effects of different strategies with FIT and guaiac fobt to determine which is the optimal strategy for our country in the Netherlands. And you see the results of that modeling here in this graph. And I realize that this is somewhat of a complicated graph, so I want to walk you through it and just give you the gist of what I'm trying to say here. But what you see on the x-axis is the costs of a screening program. And what you see on the y-axis are the life years gained with a screening program. So the more to the right a strategy is, the more expensive a strategy is. The higher a strategy is, the more effective a strategy is. So strategies that are in the upper left corner of this graph is what we consider to be cost-effective strategies because they provide a lot of life years gained for relatively low money. And so what you see here at the bottom now uh, cl clearly marked with this uh, red band, is that the strategies that are in the lower right corner, EA, where you don't want to be, that are the strategies with guaiac fecal local blood testing. So these tests provide you relatively poor benefit for the money that you need to spend on it. If we then look, oh, sorry, the wrong way, at the strategies that are in the upper left corner, you see that it is all squares. And if we look at the legend, the squares are actually associated with the fecal immunochemical test with a very low cutoff. So from a cost-effectiveness perspective, it is actually very good to do a fit test with a low cutoff because, yes, you need a lot more colonoscopies, but these colonoscopies are the cost for these colonoscopies are later earned back because you save more in treatment. However, of course, we are now in a situation where the colonoscopy capacity is not unlimited. And therefore, we also did an analysis where we looked at what if you don't have unlimited colonoscopy capacity, what is then the best way to go? And that, the results of that strategy are shown here in this graph. And the takeaway message here is that if you indeed have unlimited colonoscopy capacities, then you should do fit with a very low cutoff, um, with a wide age range, and do it every year. However, if your colonoscopy capacity is limited, what you see here is that you should increase your cutoff, narrow your age range, but only somewhat, and um, only in the very end you should take a longer interval. So based on the results of these pilot studies, based on the decision modeling happening after that, the Dutch Health Council came out with a recommendation to implement colorectal cancer screening in the Netherlands using biannual fit between the ages of 55 and 75 and using a cutoff for referral for colonoscopy originally of 15 micrograms per gram fetus based on findings that we had uh, from the pilot studies, which was based on the OC sensor test from ICON Japan. They also recommended, like most other countries, to do a phased rollout so that we could uh, gradually build up the colonoscopy capacity. So based on those recommendations, the minister decided not to immediately implement colorectal cancer screening at that time. Because the problem at that time was, well, it was just when the economic crisis really started to hit in. We had just covered the vaccination uh, program with HPV in the Netherlands, and we just covered the vaccination of um, 
uh, well, I shouldn't call it Mexican flu anymore, but everybody knows the flu that I'm talking about at that time. So there was a, a lot of expenditure going out at that time already, and there was no more money left for the colorectal cancer screening. But also an important reason to not start right away is they wanted to first map what the consequences of implementing such a program would be for the Netherlands and to see if we could make those resources available. So in 2010 and 2011, that's when we did the feasibility study. And the aim of, those, of that study was to ascertain the prerequisites for a colorectal cancer screening program and to determine how such a program could be introduced su successfully. And as part of this feasibility study, what we did is we used, again, decision modeling to estimate what resources were required each year to um, implement the program and what would be the potential bottlenecks in that implementation. And one of the first bottlenecks that came out right away, as was not completely unexpected, was the colonoscopy capacity. So um, we had um, an organization do a survey to determine what the currently uh, current demand for colonoscopies was without the program, and they also developed a methodology to estimate what the available colonoscopy capacity was at this time. And so what you see here in this graph are the white bars is the demand for colonoscopy without the program, with the gray bar on top being the additional demand when we slowly started to roll out the program as anticipated, and then with the black line being the available capacity. And you immediately see here that in 2016 to 2018, we would not have enough colonoscopy capacity for the complete rollout of the program as anticipated for those years. So when we saw that in the feasibility studies, there was great discussions between different stakeholders, and it was decided that we could probably take care of this problem by changing some shifts of the doctors, reassigning some tasks so that they would have more available time for performing the colonoscopies, and if that wouldn't work, then we could maybe delay the rollout a little bit. So this feasibility study helped us to say, okay, yes, we can do it, there are a few bottlenecks, but we can take care of them, so we should be starting. So in 2011, or 2000, yeah, 2011, it was decided, yes, we go ahead and do a screening program, but we will take another two years to plan that screening program. And what did we do during that planning? Well, first of all, we of course had to have a public tender for the tests that we would be using, which laboratories would be using the test, the packaging, et cetera, et cetera. In those two years, we also set up quality assurance program, a quality assurance program for the colonoscopy, for the pathology, for the laboratories, for the screening organizations themselves. So there was a full package of quality assurance programs being developed. But maybe most importantly, and I think Stephen also alluded to that already, is we started developing the organizational infrastructure, the IT infrastructure, to get this program rolling. This is in one slide trying to show you how the organization of the screening program in the Netherlands is organized. The financer and commissioner of the screening program is the Ministry of Health. And the Ministry of Health asks the National Institute of the Public Health and the Environment to direct the screening program. So they are not responsible for the actual um, uh, organizing of the screening program itself, but they are responsible for the direction, so they manage the screening organizations that are responsible for sending out the kids, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. As part of this um, director's function, they have established several advisory committees uh, on communication, for example, on quality assurance, on research, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we have several advisory committees. Then we have regional screening organizations, five throughout the Netherlands. So despite our geographical size, we have five screening or organizations. And these are responsible for hiring laboratories to do the testing, for hiring uh, colonoscopy centers for the colonoscopies, pathology labs, radiology departments, et cetera, et cetera. So these organizations, they are really the people that are doing the work. Now you may wonder, 
where's my position in all this? What am I doing here? Well, I work at the Erasmus Medical Center, as said, and Erasmus Medical Center, together with Antoni van Leeuwenhoek, that's the uh, Dutch Cancer Institute, are responsible for the monitoring and evaluation of the screening program. So I actually have the numbers to show to you. This graph is quite complicated, but it does capture very nicely how the screening program is organized in the Netherlands. And the first thing that you should notice is that we have here, in the middle, Screen IT. And Screen IT is our national um, screening system, um, which actually guides the whole screening process. So this is the infrastructure, the, the IT program that guides the whole process. What happens is that we have municipal records of every citizen of the Netherlands. So whenever you live in a town, you have to register in that town to be entitled to anything you want or need. And so everybody in the Netherlands is registered in this municipal reg uh, records. These are um, asked for by the screening organization and put into the central database. Based on your birth cohort, so the year in you, uh, which you were born, you get sent an invitation letter to participate in the program. And initially, again, just like in the UK, there's a pre-invitation letter, and then after two weeks, we've opted for a two-week period after a try of one week, you get sent the kit, you take the kit home, you send it back, and it gets sent immediately to the laboratory. The lab enters the test result, or the, actually it's automatically entered again back into screen IT system. So that goes automatically. Based on the outcome of the screening test, the program determines whether the test is positive or negative, so we can change whether it's positive or negative, and then a message is sent, if it's positive, to both the GP and then two days later to the participant, or if it's negative, just directly to the participant. When the people with a positive test receive their test results, they also are immediately scheduled for an appointment uh, for a colonoscopy intake with a nurse at the screening center. So that whole happens. Then when the colonoscopy is performed, automatically all the results of the colonoscopy are again entered back into the central database and um, pathology records again also get into the central database. So everything is managed from out this central IT package. So two years of planning, here comes 2013 when we were supposed to be starting. But then, of course, what happens if you do a public tender and what can happen is that you do not get the test that you have done all the pilot studies with, but you actually end up with a different test, which caused quite some discussion and debate, as I can say, in the Netherlands. So because of that, there was um, some lawsuits and some, well, a lot of things happening, but it meant that the program, unfortunately, had to be delayed by a year. So in 2014, we started with this different test. And immediately what we saw, which was good news, participation was not 60% as we had anticipated, but in that first half year, the participation was actually already 68%. So that was good news, but it also was a little bit bad news because we were already struggling with colonoscopy capacity. Then, which was also good news, is that we had anticipated that we would have about 2.8% detection rate of advanced adenomas and cancers, but we're actually getting 3.6%. So again, good news, we're finding more. However, <laughs> the bad side of this was that it was con requiring considerably more colonoscopies than we had anticipated. We were thinking that approximately 6.4% of the people would actually get positively tested but what we saw was actually 12%. And well, you can imagine what happens. This is what we originally estimated with our decision model with the original uptake and the original rollout. But now, of course, first the rollout was delayed and we were inviting uh, some extra people in 2014 to catch up. Well, then you already need more colonoscopies, but it was still okay. Then you had the higher uptake. So instead of 29,000 colonoscopies in 2014, we suddenly need 38,000 if we would have the normal positivity rate. But then with this positivity rate, we now suddenly required more than twice as many colonoscopies. Well, that was undoable. So something had to happen because waiting lists, of course, were creeping up and it was just problematic. So the immediate thing that happened is we ran into that screen IT system and we said, okay, we need to change these parameters because this is not going well. So we, we increased the 
percentage of positivity, what we assumed, not even to 12%, because we had a backlog. We needed to increase it to like um, maybe 20%, so that the number of invitations would go down automatically, because that would mean it was expecting a lot of colonoscopies, and there was a certain colonoscopy uh, provision, so then automatically everything would change, and there was much fewer invitations going out the door. So that was just to calm the waters. But then, of course, we needed to find a more sustainable solution, because otherwise we could never invite the population that we wanted to invite. So we did a problem analysis. So what we saw from the program was that there was a much higher positivity rate at the same cutoff. And what we also saw from the program is that there was a much higher detection rate than the, uh, at the, this cutoff. And I've tried to capture this, and this is quite a complicated graph, but I've tried to capture it in this graph. But what you see here in the blue line, yes, is how many advanced adenomas and cancers we are detecting at a certain cutoff. So the cutoff was based at 15, and so we were seeing that we were getting about 4% advanced adenomas and cancers. And then, of course, because if you know what happens at the 15 micrograms, you can also see what happens at higher cutoffs. And you see that de de or increasing the cutoff decreases your detection rate. But actually, if you go to this one, this is what we saw in the pilot studies. This is the fi 15 microgram per gram fetus that we saw in the pilot studies. And here you see that we have about 2.7% advanced adenoma detection rates or advanced nasoplasia detection rate. And if we want to have that same detection rate here, then actually we could increase the cutoff to around 50 microgram per gram fetuses. And very interestingly, when we plotted the positivity rate and the detection rate together, you see this graph. So every symbol here is a different cutoff. And so this symbol over here is using the 15 micrograms per gram fetus cutoff in the program, we get this very high positivity, or, yeah, positivity rate and this very high detection rate. But if we were to increase the positivity to approximately here, we would actually perform the same way as we did in the pilot studies, get the same positivity rate, get the same detection rate, it's just at a different cutoff. So that gave us a little bit of a hint what we could do to actually start to improve the program. But there were several options. So again, we performed a decision analysis and we looked at several possibilities to change the program to make sure that that colonoscopy demand was going down. Well, first of all, we were currently inviting 63, 65, 67-year-olds. Um, we could say, okay, maybe we should just throw one of these groups out and have them wait another two years before we start doing the program. So we could postpone screening in them. We were also screening the 75 and 76-year-olds. And we could say, okay, we're not bothering with them. We'll just cap capture the 75-year-olds next year. And these people, sorry, but we're, we're just not having them tested because we cannot match it. Or we could increase the cutoff for the test. So what we did is we put all these measures into our decision model. And then we s looked at what that meant for the colonoscopy requirement and for the colorectal cancer deaths. And we were hoping to find an intervention that reduced colonoscopy requirement most while not reducing the colorectal cancer deaths that we could prevent with the program as much. So that was what we're looking for. So if we kept the program as it was now with this very high positivity rate, it meant that we had to do 64,000 colonoscopies, but we would prevent 7.7 .7 colorectal cancer deaths in the population. If we were to postpone screening in 65-year-olds, we would reduce the number of colonoscopies by 49,000, so by 15,000, but we would, of course, also prevent colorectal cancer, uh, decrease colorectal cancer deaths prevented because we were doing um, fewer screening. It would reduce by 0.25. So the ratio of the two was about 60. Now, similarly, if we would forego screening, what you immediately see is that it reduces the colonoscopy demand by only 9,000, 
but actually it has a much larger impact on the colorectal cancer deaths prevented. So certainly this is not something that we should be doing because we have little impact on colonoscopies and a lot of impact on the benefit of the program. So that's not what we want. And if you look at what happens if you increase the cutoff, then you see if you increase it by to 26 microgram per gram fetus, you see immediately that the reduction in colonoscopies is about the same, but you get a lower effect on your colorectal cancer that's prevented as postponing screening in 65-year-olds. So that actually is a good way to go. Unfortunately, 26 micrograms per gram fetus wasn't going to bring us there yet, so we had to go a little bit further to 47 micrograms per gram fetus. And that's in the end what happened. So halfway 2014, program was changed, and we now increased the cutoff. And what happened? Well, this graph is a little bit hard to see, but um, it's better on your screen, actually, than on mine. Oh. Um, what you see here is the positivity rate. So this was before the, uh, I've heard, the uh, change in the program, and this was after. And this gray line that you see here is what we were anticipating from the pilots. And what you see here is that this change actually got us to where we were anticipating the program to behave. The positive predictive value went up almost to the level of what we were anticipating based on the trials, and the detection rate went down, but still was very close to what we were anticipating based on the trials. So this change really helped change the program. And what does this mean for the colonoscopies? Well, we were right back on track on what we had uh, thought of before, and also, what we saw originally, we, this was the number of the long-term impact of the program that we had estimated, and here we saw that it uh, didn't, uh, that it saved about uh, 20,000 deaths by 2032 with this higher participation, with this higher um, detection rates. Of course, the impact would, would have been bigger, but now with the change back, oh, what you see is that we're right back on the original track. So, my time's up. So just let me end with some conclusions again. I think that what has been crucial to the success of our program is that we've performed pilot studies to see which test works best for us. We've done modeling studies to determine what is the optimal strategy. We've done a feasibility study so that we could prepare for the uh, test. We had this extensive planning period with this IT infrastructure, and we are continuously monitoring and evaluation in the program to make sure that it is behaving as it should. Was it only a success? No. Of course, there were also some things that we could have done better. Um, the IT system was primarily designed for process and therefore less suitable to extract data and do these monitoring and evaluation analysis on that. That's been a pain. Um, it was unwise to start screening in the oldest age group because those are the ones with the highest uh, positivity rate and that will totally tear down your system. And currently, our adherence to diagnostic follow-up colonoscopy is unsatisfactory. Probably some of the colonoscopies are being done outside of the program, so it, we already have indication that it's not as bad as we think. But it might also be because colonoscopy is not completely covered, there is a deductible, and it might also be that a lot of people that participate are actually non-eligible for colonoscopy, and they shouldn't have participated in screening in the first place. So I want to thank you very much for your attention, and I'm sorry for running over time. I shouldn't do that as a chair. Um, I need to run off very soon to the airport, but I've left my email address here in case you have additional questions. And I also want to draw your attention to the Utopia project, which um, comes back to what we've been discussing here all day. Um, this is sort of, it's not a follow-up on the CanCon project, but it is going uh, along the lines of the CanCon project, trying to bring researchers and policymakers across Europe together to try and see how they can improve their screening programs. And one aspect of that program is that we will make web-based tool of that decision model that I've been referring to in my presentation, and that we uh, want to share with other policymakers and researchers across Europe. So thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. In simple, understandable way, but so deep and complicated uh, topic you presented. Any questions from the audience, please? <laughs> Ladies first. My only question is on data protection. How do you, did you have any issues 
from the fact that the town halls released everything, all the information that you wanted? Because in some countries, this could cause data protection issues. Yeah, so just to make sure uh, and clear, we don't have access to that information. So we only have anonymized data, tables, uh, sometimes individual records, but no uh, name, address, etc. This is um, an agreement between screening organizations and the municipal records, which is actually more like a national system, although it sounds like it's a local uh, system. Um, so it's actually a national registry that's being used, and I think that we have the Population Act for that. So there's a special law that ensures that this is possible, but only for certain screenings. Thank you. Please, next question. Two, two quick questions. Excellent presentation, as, as expected. Surveillance, uh, for us, that accounts for a quarter of the total endoscopy resource. Is it included within your program? Um, so, no. <laughs> we have, so in the decision modeling, we do always calculate both the colonoscopies needed for the primary scheme as well as for the uh, surveillance. So they have been anticipated in the resource requirements, but the actual colonoscopies being performed inside the screening program are all for diagnostic follow-up. So I think that's a big, big um, problem or um, a drawback of the way we've organized things because I think the surveillance is an essential part of the screening program. And so if people are thinking of putting together a screening program, please try and pull the surveillance in. We tried real hard, but we were not successful to try and get that in. Um, so we have taken it into account for all the calculations, but when we are trying to get colonoscopy capacity for the screening program, that's only for diagnostic follow-up. Thank you. And the second question, you, you clearly had to grow your endoscopy resource at the beginning. Can you tell us how you did that? Yes, um, well there was already a trend going upwards, so that's how one of the ways. There has been a lot of debate, there is this capacity organ that assigns how many um, gastroenterologists can be trained each year. So already at the beginning of this process they started going into the debate with this organ and the people being trained has been expanded. The other thing is that uh, nurse endoscopists start being trained. They are not used within the program because the yield of advanced adenomas and cancer is so high that these colonoscopies are actually not performed by nurse endoscopies, but the regular endoscopies can be performed by nurse endoscopists and then you have more capacity to, to do these uh, things. So that's, it has, it's been, and it's still a big issue of debate because um, at the same time that this is happening, there is a tendency to take away endoscopies from everybody but gastroenterologists, so no more, uh, we have some internists performing endoscopies. The idea is that that should not be happening anymore. So there's a lot of things going on at the same time, but I think in basis what they're trying to do is um, be more flexible uh, hours-wise, although that's also very hard, uh, and uh, use nurse endoscopists and train more endoscopists. Um, Thank you. Well, I think that your decision model also allowed to, to look at other screening policies so that, for instance, to keep the low cutoff, but then increase the screening interval, for instance, for three years, that is also acceptable by the EU guidelines. So what were the results for this kind of sensitivity analysis? We, we did not do that originally because we needed to have a solution for 2014. And you could increase the interval, but that would not help us in 2014. But I agree that that's also a solution to have a low cutoff and increase the interval. However, previous um, analysis of us had, had already showed that actually a shorter interval with a higher cutoff works better than a longer interval with a lower cutoff. So that's why we uh, didn't look at that yet. But I agree that as more data come about, about the interval cancer rate, and we can look at that also for other cutoff levels, then maybe um, we could improve the modeling, make it more precise, and see if that maybe changes with new evidence and that maybe a longer interval is also an option. I'm worried about this clinical sensitivity, also uh, invasive colorectal cancers, like the kayak based test methods, the clinical sensitivity is very, very poor. But with FIT, so that you, if you have a very, very low cutoff, so that you will have already somewhere up to 
5% sensitivity, that approach is already total colonoscopy. But when the, when the cutoff will be increased, then also the clinical sensitivity of existing invasive cancers decreases. And this is that uh, we don't understand very well yet in our programs. Yes, yeah, so, so to make clear, we don't assume 95% um, sensitivity for the test at all. Um, actually, what we assume is that the sensitivity is probably higher, closer to clinical diagnosis than so for later stage cancers than for earlier stage cancers. So that's incorporated. And I think we are currently, on average, for all cancers, somewhere between 65 and 70 percent. So that's the assumption that we have for fit right now. So, but of course, if you lower the cutoff, then your um, uh, sensitivity will increase. Okay, I will. Like Thank you for speaker. Yes. Thank you very much. I'm running off now. <laughs> now we have uh, small changes, and uh, I would like to invite the next speaker, uh, uh, Professor of Surgery Thomas, Thomas Boskus. He is um, representing Vilnius University Hospital Santa Rishku Clinicus and. He would like to say us about colorectal cancer screening in Lithuania. Please, colleague. The floor is yours. Thank you. It is actually very difficult to follow on these two talks and uh, talk about the screening program that is going on in Lithuania. Uh, but I will have to do this. And uh, I would just like to remind you that um, we come from the funding area uh, which is among the lowest shown previously on the on the slides uh, so uh, colorectal cancer is among the most burdensome diseases in Lithuania and uh, if you take the incid incidence in Europe we are probably somewhere in the middle but if you take mortality our mortality is increasing um, stage-wise more, most of our patients in 2012 presented uh, at a later or unspecified, which usually means later stage. And our survival data is poor in comparison to other European countries and even to Eastern European data. So uh, we looked at the standards and uh, looked at the data and uh, the, the screening program in Lithuania was set up. And it actually is quite different from what you heard before. It is mostly based on, uh, it is a population-based uh, screening, as you will see later, but it's mostly based on the family physician, uh, where he would give out invitations to everyone who, who comes of age, who becomes 50, uh, and who comes to visit him. And um, uh, some primary care facilities would send out invitations to all the, to all the uh, people of certain age. Uh, they would include a uh, fecal immune test, uh, or it, as it was previously called, IFOBT. Um, and if a positive test, the, the family physician would refer for colonoscopy. A diagnostic institution would perform a colonoscopy and then re refer the patient back with the results, and then, and then the, the patient would go for screening uh, for treatment of colorectal cancer or for surveillance or repeated screening. Uh, uh, if you look at the Lithuanian population, two main areas, Vilnius and Konas, are, are the dominant areas and the other are smaller ones. So actually it was, the program was rolled out in, uh, as a pilot in 2009 and then in 2012 it, it was expanded a little bit and 2013 uh, more expansion and finally in 2014 it was a uh, complete national uh, coverage of the program. We can see the increasing number of people participating every year. Uh, and uh, it is, the program itself is divided into several points. And one is information and uh, in fecal testing service. As you can see, it is increasing and uh, positive FOBT is, makes up minority as, as expected. We makes up minority of patients, but uh, still, we are covering about 
20% or 25% of the population, screening population every year, and that is very low. We, uh, we interviewed our patients why they were not participating, and the awareness of, the, of, our, of our population of the program is small, and those who don't attend their family physician, they would just not get invitation, and they would not get screening. Another problem that we identified is we have rather a uh, significant, significant number of, patient, of uh, people who would be FIT positive uh, and uh, only about half of the people would get referrals for colonoscopy and even less would get a colonoscopy. Uh, we looked at the institutions which, uh, which would reach the threshold of 90% of referrals for colonoscopy after positive FIT and uh, unfortunately less than 5% of institutions, of primary care institutions produce this, uh, these results. So, and there is no correlation between the size, location, or level of the facility and colonoscopy performance, and so there's a significant number of patients within our program who have positive FIT and who don't get a colonoscopy within the program. Uh, although I have to say that there would be a significant number of patients that we are not aware of that would get a colonoscopy outside of the program. They would get a uh, colonoscopy from, from other institutions, but they would not get uh, funded as a uh, program patient. In 2015, we had 21,000 positive FITs and only more than 12,000 colonoscopies, about 60%. That is very unacceptable, I think. Uh, some, what, what we have uh, within our program, there would be significant number of patients who would get, have their colonoscopy under anesthesia with anesthesiologists present, and I, that is related to local uh, medical, uh, medical, medical legal leg, uh, regulations. Uh, uh, endoscopists cannot provide sedation in Lithuania, so that then if you want colonoscopy under sedation, you would have to have anesthesiologist, and that uh, people tend to to choose more often than without sedation. Uh, pathology reporting, uh, we get 7% uh, of cancers from all the pathology and we have high grade dysplasia of 13% from all the pathology and about it would be about 3% from all the colonoscopy. So that's acceptable, I think, when you, when you look at the, at the rates. Uh, so we have 25% per year, less than about 46% per for, for the first three years that we did. So we invite everyone, uh, we tend to invite everyone who comes to us, but only f half of the people would come to us. Uh, those who come and those who get invited, they get, uh, they get, uh, they accept the program usually. Uh, but only half of those who have positive FIT get referrals for colonoscopy. Uh, and uh, although less, less people get referrals, but more people get colonoscopy. Uh, pathology is reported in a specialized form and we have about, uh, as I mentioned, about 3.9% of high-grade dysplasia. Financing is not a problem. Is the, the financing of the program is, is national. It's uh, national health, health insurance, so for the patient it's free. Um, and so the screening program was implemented, meaning that any screening is better than no screening. So in that sense, and, uh, the program was implemented, but definitely changes in the invitation process for screening are suggested and are being in the discussion process as, as we speak. Referral for colonoscopy should definitely be improved after positive FIT. Um, and uh, overall, we had more than one million people screened in the country, and we, are a uh, po we have a population of less than three million and more than 1,000 cancers were diagnosed earlier. Thank you. Thank you for short and comprehensive information about your situation. And now questions from the audience. Please, Matsis. Yeah, thank you. Congratulations, really, that you have made the decision to implement the FIT test-based screening. But I have two questions. First, uh, who is reading the FIT test results? And the second is, what type of FIT tests are you using, quantitative or qualitative? In most, 
in there would be some centers that would be using larger primary as as i mentioned it's all based on the primary care facilities so larger primary care facilities like the huge polyclinics in vilnius that have 100,000 populations they would have quantitative quantitative testing but for the most popu for the other population it would be qualitative uh, fit testing but but who is reading the results because what it's we what we heard from Lithuania that the subject itself is reading results. Is it really the case? Uh, yes, basically, if it's a qualitative test, the patient would would see the result, but the, but he would give bring the the kit to the family physician who would be doing this and who. So actually, the patient is reading the result, him or herself. Uh, the final decision is on the primary physician. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, could you describe about your invitation process? Is it uh, organized or opportunistic? Uh, it it depends. Uh, actually, it's uh, I, w I would not call it completely opportunistic because there would be uh, there is a requirement that everyone who who is who turns 50 should get invited by his or her primary physician for screening. So you cannot call this opportunistic. Uh, and in some primary care facilities, there would be uh, routine invitation letters sent out to everyone who is of age, and sometimes you get an SMS on your phone that you have to go and check the colon. But uh, in the smaller institutions, private primary care institutions that would serve small populations, they would uh, end up not inviting everyone. And there is unfortunately no way to uh, penalize them for that. Thank you. My question was Next going question, to be very please. similar, but as you speak, a thought occurs. Would it not be possible to standardize it across the country? Because it seems to me that you have quantitative, qualitative, asking, not asking, uh, and we all know that we all like to gossip. So Mrs. A says to Mrs. B, well, I had this, and she'll say, well, no, I had something different. And it confuses the population. So, well, I totally agree with you, and I think I think we saw an excellent, excellent presentations and excellent ways to go. But uh, the other thing you, you have to think about is putting yourself into perspective, because when when you showed the nice slide about the London who has five tiers of of uh, population wealth, I think we lost about two hundred thousand people to London, and they went mostly to that fifth tier in London. I would I would uh, expect. So, and these are considered rich people in Lithuania. So, you know, that, I think that, that would explain some, some of the situation that, that you have difference from Netherlands or UK. But uh, on the other hand, I think, yes, I think standardization is, is the way to go and, I, and we are working on that. I think it's the rich people in, uh, in London that probably t took advantage of it. Our problem is the, is the, is the poor people in London, which is a fairly large proportion. I think even charitably, mm -hmm. I'd have to say that what you've described from a patient perspective is an opportunistic program. Because I just, you know, if, if I don't happen to go to my GP, I won't receive an invitation. So that, I, I think that would define it as opportunistic, and it sounds perhaps surprisingly that even if you do get a positive test, you may not have a colonoscopy, so that's a bit opportunistic as well. Yes. So, uh, I yeah. think... Uh, on the issue of the test, I mean, Marcus has, has mentioned it, and we saw, of course, a good example from Iris, mm -hmm. that different quantitative fit tests can give different results, and qualitative test results can be vastly different. Um, adding to that the additional factor that it's being read by somebody who's not an expert mm -hmm. and these tests aren't they're a bit like pregnancy tests you know there's an element of interpretation so i think it's very clear to me that if you're organizing a program and if you're looking for a test now the only solution is a quantitative test and there are three or four on the market, and even they will be slightly different, so you need to do some piloting work before you make your final decision. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if no more questions. Thank you, speaker. And now we have...
four presentations and according to our planet activities, next is panel discussion and uh, of course uh, official moderator from Finland, she is not here. I invite my colleague uh, Marcia Slee to be moderator and colleagues uh, Arti Antila and Stephen Halakan and also colleagues from Lithuania. Please come and will for discussions. Okay, I think we are a bit behind the time, but, but anyhow, I think the panel discussion would be very important and appreciated. And um, actually, I would like to start with this, if you don't mind. And uh, going back to the history, uh, somebody of you may recall, somebody of you may not. In the first part of this uh, conference, we heard a very nice uh, presentation from Ladislav, and we really saw the Czech example as, as uh, the good example to be followed. But I wanted to indicate that this is not the first time we consider Czech example as the best example that could be followed. And it was more than 10 years ago in 2005, we had a conference here. Uh, here was my good friend, Bochumel Seifert. And uh, we were looking at the good example of the colorectal cancer screening programs and seemed to be really very exciting program and very promising program that could work out perfectly. And Actually, what we did, and together with Eric Smicky, this we were on the meeting uh, board meeting in the ministry, and we also decided to follow the Czech example to, to get the reimbursement to the GPs, and we succeeded to do this. The problem is that, as you saw from the figures in Latvia, it didn't work. It was 10% coverage, and it is not um, expected that it's going to increase to the minimum standards. But unfortunately, that didn't work also in Czech Republic, and uh, now we can be uh, happy with the fact that we haven't invested the big money like Czech Republic did. So how, how maybe this would be the question to Ladislav, but maybe also to others, what really should be the way to go for, and do we have a difference from what we have now and then, and, and, and indeed what has happened during these 10 years? Thank you for challenging question. <clears throat> In 10 years ago, it was 2007, 2006, and uh, I must say that <clears throat> at that time, the, the Czech corrector, uh, corrector cancer screening just started in a new design, and uh, it was supported by, by uh, Ministry of Health, and the support was interrupted very strongly in 2009. Our coverage at, uh, in 2007 was, I guess, not exactly 12%, 15% our coverage in 2007. And currently we have, uh, in the whole population, whole target population, we, we have uh, 32. And in the population age uh, 55 to 69, uh, we have 41. So it's not sufficient, of course. Uh, we would be happy if we can reach 60% or even 70%, as you saw in Netherlands. But uh, at that time, it was not an example to be followed because we, the, the GPs in the Czech Republic were not organized well. They started to use 12 or 14 different tests from different producers. You saw it, Stefan saw it two years ago even. And uh, it, it, uh, uh, we, we tried to change it uh, starting in 2012. And it was really changed in 2015, 2016. So currently they are standardized a little bit. And now we are discussing very strongly to change the, the whole strategy uh, to switch the program uh, to, to quantitative testing. But uh, which is, this is the negative part of the, of, of, the, of the mission. The positive part is that uh, 
um, speaking about the organization of primary care in the Czech Republic, it's quite effective to use or to involve GPs because in our country we have in fact 98% uh, registration and many, many outpatient services are distributed through GPs. So I can say that uh, nearly each citizen uh, is, is uh, forced to visit GP, for example, at least once a year. So, so uh, the, it's a good pathway and it's a good touch point or network to organize or to, to be the, the entry, uh, entry gate to, uh, to the screening. But it was not enough for women population, so in 2014 we involved to the screening gynecologists because they distribute many, many, uh, uh, they organize care for women in, in the Czech Republic. I don't know how is it in, in Latvia or Lithuania, but in the Czech Republic GP, uh, uh, primary uh, gynecologists who register women are very strong and very well organized uh, networks. So involvement of the, of the uh, gynecologists uh, improved the coverage by 13%, I guess now. So this is all I can say from the Czech Republic. But in 2007, the new design organized through, through GPs just started and real success I can see uh, from 2014, so we are we are we are really not champions uh, in correct cancer screening. That, that's true. We are champions in breast cancer screening, hopefully in cervical cancer screening, but not in correct cancer screening. Now, sorry, just one just one sentence. Uh, as a parallel modality, you can you can choose in our country uh, primary screening colonoscopy and starting from 55 years of age, I must say it's extremely weak arm of our, of our screening, up to 2% of, of, of incrementing coverage. So people prefer to go through GPs and to go through uh, IFOBT testing and then if it, if it is positive, positive, so FOBT positive colonoscopy, not primary screening colonoscopy. That's all. If you would like to follow the Czech Republic, please skip the 10 years period uh, of, of uh, looking for, for the best strategy. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, actually, I recognize that this was a challenging, actually, question and issue, but I think that was not more meant to criticize what is happening in Czech Republic, but really to, to find out the best way to proceed, because uh, what has been just now demonstrated from Lithuania, as Stephen has mentioned, is just an opportunistic screening, and we may call it in different way in documents, even in Latvia it was called an organized screening, but it never has been an organized screening for colorectal cancer. Uh, and, and really this issue, whether GP should be the center or not, that is a big uh, question. And um, the, the, actually the experience of the other countries also has indicated that when going through GPs you are not really reaching the target. But really how to proceed at this stage, and maybe Stephen could, could comment on this or give his opinion. Again about GPs. Not only. How to, how to improve the system. Okay. Can, I address, can we address that, that element of it uh, in a minute? I just like to go back to this this period of uh, period of time to develop a program. Now I, I have a conversation with Yola from time to time, where I I say, well, you know, it can take ten years to set up a program, and Yola will say, surely it doesn't need to take that long length of time. I'm moving a little bit in the direction of Yola, <laughs> but only a little bit. Uh, and, it's, it's clear from the stories, even stories that we've heard today, that it seems to be very easy to set up a screening program and get it wrong and have to go back and change it. But not just change it subtly, but to radically change it. Um, and I think that a few of those situations are illustrations of it being set up too quickly and not sufficient thought being given to it. Sometimes it's due to difficulties that exist within an individual country, some of the constraints, and it's easier to go for the quick solution rather than to tackle 
as the Czech Republic is doing now and has done rather spectacularly address some of the fundamental issues to get those right before moving on. But I'm moving a little bit in Yola's direction because it does seem to me that we have ample evidence now of the effectiveness of fit based screening programs they're, and they're easier to run than the old quiet programs it's a single test uh, an opportunity to vary the cutoff you can change the cutoff into the program with little with little impact uh, in terms of the media so we have a right test we have lots of examples of good ways of running screening programs um, and so therefore doesn't necessarily need to take 10 years from the first thought. I think that potentially after six years, careful thought and planning, uh, it is possible to do it. And I'm a little unforgiving. This is where I'm being provocative to Atty. I think it is rather difficult now for some of the Scandinavian countries who have the resources, they have the infrastructure, and yet has st are still not screening the whole of their population. So, Atti, would you like to respond to that challenge? Oh, yes. So, you mean that, like in Finland, we have still the randomized pilot, so that uh, just the proportion of the target population is invited, and the uh, proportion is left uninvited. And in Sweden, there is a huge randomized trial ongoing that the intervention arm is either full colonoscopy screening uh, once in a lifetime or, or then ultra-sensitive uh, FIT and still controls are left unwinded. So that these are uh, governmental decisions were based on the accept, ac acceptance of the government so that not the whole target population is yet invited. And um, I think that uh, um, nowadays um, we have certain problems and challenges. One challenge is that how can we build up the quality management, quality assurance system for colonoscopies? And at the same time also to look to colonoscopy resources and current uses of colonoscopies. And like in, in Finland, we have generally lots of resources in our healthcare. But we have such a, how to say, um, not well coordinated service in hospitals nationwide that so that lead colonoscopists for instance they have not yet agreed what is the what are the key quality criteria what are the key quality indicators how can we monitor the service and how we can redirect the resources so we have cut this debate for years and then for some years it has stopped but still we have not yet completely fully you know completely open manner solved this problem and we have to still to work with this so that if we don't have the colonoscopy quality right then then uh, we can really guarantee that the program would work optimally i'm sure we want to plan an optimal program and another challenge is choosing test systems so that if you don't have resources for colonoscopy, optimal resources, then you have to increase your cutoff in the modern tests like uh, quantitative FIT. That means that then you also reduce the effectiveness of the program in preventing cancers. So that there is some studies already in, in this FIT test showing that there is really good mortality reduction already with a little bit lower uh, cutoff values but can we still optimize the, the thing? And, and that is a problem. And in fact, if, if, if thinking of our current planning needs in Finland, so that I think that uh, it is not necessary to leave the whole population or part of the population uninvited anymore, so that we can solve these kind of optimi optimization questions also with careful planning. It is in 2060s this planning is much easier than it was in 2002, 2003. So that these experiences that we have learned from UK, from Netherlands, from many other countries, this, this really helps planning. So that 
It is not, not necessary to left uninvited anymore. And then um, I think that third concern is to how to reach high uptake. In the European guidelines, the uptake rates for colorectal cancer screening in the benchmarks are much lower than for breast cancer and cervical cancer screening. And in fact, the validity of the FIT test is, is poorer compared to validated cytology or HPV test, HPV test against cervical cancer. I mean that the uptake rates should be higher than recommended or accepted by the guidelines nowadays, so that this 70% should be set as a minimal target. And it, it has been shown, shown in, not in every country, but in few programs, that, that, that is achievable also. So that th this is also something that causes then some needs for, uh, for uh, further evaluations and planning work. But sure, how to optimize the uptake that you can do and the strategies you can build up either non-randomized or randomized uh, minor in your program when you are already invited, ev inviting everybody so that you can try to improve the invitational strategies also in randomized uh, studies within the program while inviting everybody. So that uh, just to summarize my response to Stephen, so that if, if the Swedish government has decided that they don't want to invite everybody, so I'm not in the position to, to say that they had a wrong decision, but so that I, I mean that government has their responsibility over their population and they have, they have respected this responsibility. But I don't want to say that every program should do only in such a randomized manner that leave some part of the target potential target population uninvited. And in case it, that if you don't have resources to cover 50 to 74 or 55 to 74, so the guidelines already say, the current guidelines, that you can start with a narrow age group, 60 to 69 or something like that or 60 to 64 even. And then look that everything goes right and then you can later on expand the program. That is another solution also that is even recommended with the guidelines. But member states, just part of the member states have considered also this option. But in a country here in Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia, if resources are a problem, also such a strategy could well be there on that end. It still, it still seems to me iniquitous that countries like Finland, Sweden, uh, Norway, uh, that do have the resources, they have the recipe, and if I was a member of the public, it would be a matter of flicking a coin as to whether I was going to be lucky enough to be screened. I, I'm curious to know what the views would be from Latvia and Lithuania now that we have a recipe. Stephen, can I just put a joke in here? I'm going to embarrass Ati now because 10 years ago when Inquiry was involved with screening in Finland, um, I remember discussing it with her and she said, Yola, I, we have no problem with compliance. We just tell the Finns they have to do it and they do it. <laughs> so does that still work? <laughs> Sorry, could you repeat? There's so much. <laughs> <laughs> Ten years ago, when I was talking to Inquiry, when you were first starting all your pilots and looking at everything, and I said to her, How are you going to get the Finns to comply? And she said, That's not a problem. We just tell them they have to do it, and they do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, the uh, Finnish population is screening prone population, and that is because of historical reasons and also quite good results that we have got both in cervical cancer screening and breast cancer screening programs. The first studies in successful cervical cancer screening program were published all in the 1970s and, uh, and so that the population trusts really, really screening and um, 
so that uh, then when we think of some new can cancer screening programs, so I think that this is the background that we have really the luxury of so the they do comply. screening prone population. But still we have to do also lots of campaigning, informing, everything. It's very special, specific activities, as we have done also for colorectal cancer screening program. I think more than that, your GUIAC program, uh, the uptake of the GUIAC program was, was the highest in the world. It's just that 50, only 50% of, of the population had an opportunity to do it. But it was, I think now the Netherlands have got a higher uptake than you did, but it was the highest in the world. So I think at his right, you just need to give everybody the opportunity to do it and then, then it would work. Okay, I'll, I'll answer your question about general practice. And all the evidence shows that if you, in, that you, if you involve general practice fundamentally in the process of invitation, you will not reach an uptake greater than 60%. No country has done that yet. Um, not, not many countries have got above 60% anyway, but it, it, it certainly cuts it at that, that level. Um, and there's a lot of countries that have tried it. So if you want, if you want to have a, a good uptake, or perhaps not the 70% that we should aspire to, I agree, we should be aspiring towards it, then you don't involve GP fundamentally in the process. So the question to Latvia and Lithuania, my question is that we now have a recipe, we have a test that can be performed, we have, the stan we have standards that can be aspired to, why don't we just go ahead and do it? I know there are reasons. Simple and at the same time complicated question. Uh, of course, uh, when we start this uh, screening some years ago, in theory it was a simple model uh, because uh, 95, more than 95% uh, of uh, inhabitants registered to family doctor. Everybody visit at least per once per year on family doctor. No charges. Really simple. Just give test and uh, response. But uh, it means same, uh, how to say, uh, simple model without uh, other factors. It works not so good and uh, maybe that only some emotional side effects, uh, let's say. It's com uh, traditional thinking about complication of doing that and uh, maybe not so active uh, pushing to family doctors and asking results and maybe some additional, additional payment Yes, it is, but probably it's not only one. And now, now we, we see what we have. And um, understanding your your uh, small small comment, it, it it doesn't work if it's only one. And probably no simple uh, decision how to change. And as I understand now, it's um, it it's. Not enough to change, for example, test from one test to another test or just organization. He needs more factors to do and my colleagues from uh, this area on backside, they're sitting here and it is it's a target and it's duty for us to do in future. But really today I don't have a recipe what we will do and can, can I ask? If, 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 if I may add to this, uh, actually a couple of years ago uh, within the project of the Euro, um, uh, University of Latvia, we have conducted a pilot study uh, comparing fit tests with the tests and actually the pilot DIGA was, was leading the study. And actually, what we got from the pilot study was that it is absolutely possible to achieve at least the minimum uh, number of participation, 45% with fit test, but with pre-invitations and in particular 
reminder letters. So these are only the ones that we are providing in the current situation with the current knowledge of the population. So I think that was a good message that we are not different from any other country and actually if to set up the program in a proper way, if it is working, of course, if it's not set in a proper way, as we acknowledge right now, our decision 10 years ago, it's not working. That's quite logical. The problems are several other problems. And also, like in Lithuania, the further referrals or acceptance to colonoscopy was absolutely insufficient. It was more than 50%, but it was also close to this, it was approximately 60% in spite of three reminder letters. So definitely there's a space to improve the knowledge, uh, the place of the patient organizations, absolutely to speak to the population if the person has got a positive test that colonoscopy should be attended. The third critical issue is the quality of the follow-up investigations. And that is not unique for colonoscopy, that's for any other screening. And it's easier to cite somebody who is not in the room. One of the colleagues from Estonia told, I know that my colleague, the next doors, is doing a lousy colonoscopy. How I will go to him and say that he is doing really not the proper job because we are colleagues. So in that way, it's uh, not working and it will not work. So definitely you need to have criteria and you need to have, and we do have criteria for a quality of colonoscopy. It's easy to register, but these have to be registered. And unfortunately, we didn't have the chance of Jaroslav Regula from Poland to attend. He has got a family problem, and that's the reason why he didn't come. He, he is really one of the few people in Europe that has set a perfect quality assurance program and we have good examples in Poland, in Slovenia, in UK. So it is really easy to be followed but that has to be done. Still in the case if the system is not set up we cannot expect any quality from the colonoscopy at least. That's my consideration. But maybe, maybe we can ask Lithuania to come. Thank you. Uh, well, I think I totally agree that, that the, the the answers are presented here. We we don't you know we don't have to invent the system. It's there. Uh, I think um, from from our standpoint, I think that uh, starting at least starting a program. It, okay, I, I totally agree. It's it's not good at all. But starting and screening million doing million tests for the for the people is educating the population is educating the family physicians is so if five years ago nobody knew what colonoscopy is or what screening is at all so patients would come and ask should i be screened is it, is it my age that i should be screened i think it's important and i think i think uh, we are discussing how to how to improve and i think one of the, the ways to go is probably move from family physician away to the centers of invitation to the structure similar that uh, that you have or, or that netherlands have and uh, have somebody, n and probably a nurse, follow up on the results and, and talk to the patients about colonoscopy. I think that's that's the way to go, and and hopefully we'll re we'll, we'll reach that. But it's not going to happen in very very short span of time. Can I can I interject here because um, I'm dying to say this now, but every culture and every country is different. And I find it strange because from the East European perspective, we trust our GPs. We have a better relationship with our GPs than we have with our governments. Because our governments change every five minutes, our GP normally stays with us for life. All right, there is migration. So I quote the French example. I mean, the French started um, with a... Uh, an invitation from the ministry and that failed and then they went to GPs and that worked. So my understanding here is surely, oh I can see Professor Halloran is getting ready to answer me back, but um, for me the most logical thing in each country would be to do a pilot to see how best people respond. Um, you know, do 50% with one invitation and 50% with another, and then you, you will get an answer. And I just want to add one other thing. 
our GP or my GP, a rural GP, decided that he was getting very frustrated that his patients weren't taking up the invitation. So he wrote to them personally. So the letter came from him and it said, dear Mrs. So-and-so, you know, we would really like you to come. Now, he had an amazing reaction because it was personalized. And uh, the, the skeptics said, oh, but they're not coming because they want to look after themselves. They're coming out of loyalty to their GP. My response was, I don't care who does what, they're coming. So, Stephen, why can't we do it that we test what country reacts best? Well, as far as France is concerned, their uptake is still poor. It, it is still poor, and they've just moved over to FIS, uh, and uh, I, I'm expecting it to go up uh, from what it was with Guayac. Uh, but they're a, they are another example of, of how, by involving primary care physicians, overall it doesn't work. Now, that isn't to say that individual general practitioners who are very vociferous, who've got the time, are convinced may not have an impact. I think they'll probably have more of an impact with women who have a closer relationship, generally speaking, with their GP than the men because they've had to see them throughout their, their earlier life. Um, there, is, there is good um, research evidence that was conducted in, in uh, Italy that has shown that it, it has not been, in fact, it, it's good with some GPs but not with others. Overall, for a population, we are talking about population screening, it's not a recipe that has been proven to work well. So at this point in time, there's a good reason not to go that way if you were starting a program. Otherwise, you've got to mend a program that is already functioning and not functioning very well. I think right now we are uh, um, exactly <laughs> half an hour over the time, but we have had an excellent presentation, and I would suggest that uh, Tit could complete maybe the, <laughs> or, or in the case if you are raising questions, of course we will be forced no, to answer. No, 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 it's, uh, it's actually a, a reaction to this discussion, because uh, we also had some bad and positive experience with these experimentations. Um, <clears throat> confirming what Yola said, uh, because we have a similar principle as in the UK or the Netherlands, so we have our um, chosen GPs, there is a lot of confidence and so on. So when our institute started the screen, uh, colorectal sc screening program, at the very beginning, GPs were completely excluded. So they were out of the picture. And what happened was exactly what you were saying. They started calling their GPs. So what is this? Is this a commercial activity? Is this, uh, I mean, it was indicated who organized it and so on. But it's, there was still lack of confidence. Then we modified it in a way that we involve GPs in the sense that they are informed about uh, all the steps. So either the, uh, whatever the result of your uh, occult blood test is, it will go in parallel to, to your GP. So you can also call and say, well, it's positive, is it the end of the world, and so on. So this is one thing. Of course, there, I'm concerned about leaving it entirely to the GPs because of another story we are facing now. I think it's almost a global story, and this is the lack of confidence and trust in vaccination. And there we see, in our country, we are currently analyzing a big survey on attitudes of health professionals to vaccination. And we see that there are between 40 and 50 percent of skeptics. So if you leave it to the GPs, the GP will say, well, you know, this, these screening programs, they actually just overload people with worries and they, they serve to no purpose. I mean, and if you trust that GP, you will end the story there. So, <clears throat> and it's very difficult to have such a big team of doctors on board all aligned the same uh, principle. So this is my concern. Otherwise, 
I think the, the building of this trust and strengthening is, and I'm sure that there is also a uh, large variation by country. We spoke over lunch with, with Steve. There are countries where, for example, there is a negative attitude to feces. People don't want to even consider even indirectly touching it, uh, dealing with it, and so on. So, or, or culturally within countries. I entirely agree that the results do need to go to GPs. That, that is what we do. They're informed at the outset how the program works. I think we should do more about that, frankly. But they are informed and they have a leaflet. But they are informed at every step along the route. So they get to know whether the test is positive or, or negative, And they get to know whether somebody has responded. So they have an opportunity to encourage and support, but they're not axial, they're not central to the process of invitation. Okay, in the case if there are no urgent other questions, I would like then to thank everybody, the panelists and the participants, and I hope we still could get coffee, so 20 minutes coffee break, and then with some delay we are coming back to the room for the last session.